Welcome to FaithWorks, the enlightening and empowering program that builds your faith to help you overcome every single challenge in this life. My name is Kaude Adeshoga. I'm your host. I want you to sit back, listen, and be blessed. God bless you. When people change from being filthy and they become holy and they do righteousness, God is glorified. So you must understand when I say God first is these things, not the cathedral. The cathedral may or may not. But when God says to God first, it may not be to church first. You must understand that. The kingdom of God is not the church. The kingdom is inside the church. When you give your life to Christ, the Bible says we are saved by grace, through faith, you become born again. You are a part of the general assembly of the church. You are a part of the body of Christ. You are a member of the church universal. But James says that we shall, through tribulation, enter into the kingdom. We don't, through tribulation, get saved. So, entry into the kingdom is not the same as getting saved. There are many who are saved who are not part of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God are those who are custodians of the rule of God. Every person that is the kingdom is born again. But not every person that is born again is of the kingdom. Kingdom first, not church first. Don't make that error. They are not the same. Seek the kingdom, the need of the kingdom. Now, the kingdom is inside the church. So, raising funds for the cathedral may not be the kingdom. And that's what people must understand. Jesus said, they, they do not say the kingdom is here. No, you do not say it is here or it is there. Now, church is there. You can tell the address. They say, oh, what's the name of your church? You call it Instant Riches Melonia um, Turn from Wilderness to Melonia Church. Woo! Everybody likes that. They want to go. Please, where is your church? You believe I come to your church, I can be a villain. They say, yes. Then they give you the address. It's at number 2000 uh, Olua Saw Owolato Rusile Street. And then you have the address. But Jesus said the kingdom has no address. He said, they do not say it is here. Neither do you say it is there. For lo, the kingdom is within thee. So the kingdom... The church has a physical connection. The kingdom has no physical connection. It's a spiritual. That is what, when you give to, that addresses all your need, not church. Oh, you must understand that the, the kingdom of God existed before the church, but has been incorporated into the church. And that's why Many people misquote the scripture. It says, the kingdom of God suffered violence. He didn't say the church. And the violent take it by force. I've seen people use that to pray. They say, they're shooting Satan is the kingdom of violence. No, no, no. That's not what he's saying. If you want to understand what the scripture is saying, you look at what it says in Matthew. Look at what it's saying in Mark and Luke and compare them together. In Luke, it says, from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God is being preached. And men are pressing into it. He said, the prostitutes, the harlots, entered the kingdom before the Pharisees. He said, they will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom above. He said, and you, the Sahendri, will be cast out. Now, what the Lord is saying is that from the time John the Baptist came, before then, the kingdom was closed. Nobody can enter it except God calls you to come and enter he called Abraham. The Bible says he called him from the father's house. Come and enter the kingdom. He called Isaac. He called Jacob. The Bible says Esau sought the kingdom with tears. It was denied him. He couldn't enter. If God didn't call you, you can't enter. He said, but from the days of John the Baptist, they've opened the doors of the kingdom to everyone and the prostitutes are running into it. Wow, that's what the scripture says. He's not talking about violence. He's talking about Strong-hearted men are running into it, including prostitutes and harlots. 
That's what that scripture is saying. So the kingdom of God is not the physical assembly we see, though it's a spiritual entity that resides inside the church. That's why Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see. You have to be born again first to be able to see the kingdom. You cannot see the kingdom. You get saved by faith through grace. By grace, through faith, Jesus paid for it. For the kingdom, you will pay to get it. That's why Mark 4 said, the kingdom of God is like unto a man who found a, a treasure of a great price, which he sold everything he had. To buy it, you buy the kingdom is not free. You pay for it. You don't, you pay to enter, um, to enter the church to get saved. But Jesus paid for that with his blood. It's not free too. But the kingdom you will pay this time around. You will give up something you dear and it's precious to assess that kingdom. Now back to what I was saying. Elijah told the woman, make me First, that is a kingdom city before this woman. That's a kingdom machinery. If we had just 10 kingdom machineries in the leadership of the church, oh, Jesus Christ, not all, oh, goodness me. There's a difference between a general overseer who sits over a large congregation and the kingdom of God in personally fighting a human being. My goodness. That, you know, the kingdom of God with Moses was that rod in his hand. Just one. One, he brought Egypt to his knees. You'll be wondering why the church has been harassed like this. There are no kingdom materials. They are not there. We have church materials, no kingdom. When the kingdom materials are unleashed, they are being prepared by God. They are the sons of God. When he brings the Bible says creation is waiting for the manifestation, not of the bishops, not of the pastors, but of the manifestation of the sons of God. These men that possess the kingdom, when God opens them up, Oh no, Jesus Christ. Oh, the most powerful nation on earth will crumble under their feet. But let's leave it at that. Amen. Now, in the case of our sister Hannah, Hannah is a lovely lady who has been believing God to have a child and it just kept eluding her. It just did not come. Bible says that she was married to Elkanah, who had two wives, Penina and herself. Penina had children, but Hannah just did not have any child. Now, in verse 3, for Samuel, chapter 1, this man called Hannah went up out of the city yearly to worship, to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priest of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave uh, Hannah, he gave to Penina his wife and to her children and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion for he loved Hannah. But the Lord shut up her womb. Now please, let me also say this. God didn't close her womb, don't you have children? It means that whatever closed it had permission from God to go ahead and do it. God doesn't close people's wombs. God can't tell the mankind to be fruitful, to increase and multiply and be closing their wombs. That is a diabolic human being. Satan is diabolic. The Bible says God is yea, yea, nay, nay. He's not yea and nay. So if God says be fruitful, he will never shut your womb. Never. It's Satan that does that. But sometimes in Satan doing it, God will not intervene because he can use that situation to glorify himself and glorify that woman. Like in the case of Hannah. Now, her adversary provoked her sore to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Hannah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? Why we press down? No, why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? Her not response means it's no. You're not better to me than ten sons. Praise God. <laughs> so Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat at the seat by a post of the temple of the Lord and 
Hannah refused to go. She was in bitterness of the soul and prayed and wept so and listened to what she said. She vowed a vow and said, O oh Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your handmaid, remember me and not forget thy handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a man child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Now, Eli was spent and God was done with Eli because judgment was coming to his house. So he needed another priest. And Hannah just walked into that need and said, Lord, I give my fourth son to you as your priest. Take him, let him be yours forever and ever. I will not lay claim to him. Do to him as you so wish. And then you all know the story. She gave birth to Samuel. And I guess she had four or five more other sons after that. So why was her need addressed when she decided to give what she wanted to God first and then take the one that came second? And God gave her two, three, four, five, and six. Amen. Now, the story goes on and on in the Bible. If you look at David's life, when he was living in his own house, he said, no, I'm not going to live in my house until the house of the Lord is built first. God's house first. And in, if you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, from verse 1 to 17, David said, I can't be moving in a, I can't be in a house and the tent of God is in a tent. He must have his house first. And God told David, you can't build a house for me because your hands are filled with blood. But your son, who will come after you, he will build my house for me. But for this gesture you have offered to me, I promise you one thing. Now listen to this. It sounds partial. If your sons misbehave like Saul, I will not remove them. Wow, Jesus Christ. I will not turn my back on them. Wow, that sounds partial. But the Bible says God is not partial. He said, I will kill them with my rod and draw them back. That's number one. Meaning, there is nothing the children of David do worse than the sons of Eli, worse than the sons of Saul. They will never lose that throne. Number two, I guess, maybe that's what Eli too should have done to secure the lineage of his children in the priesthood. Maybe that's what Saul too could have done to secure the lineage of his own son in the kingship. They could have offered God first. Now, there was nothing they did that was extraordinary that David did. David committed adultery. David committed murder. And David numbered Israel, putting Israel at enmity with God. In a general retrospective, David was worse than the sins Eli committed. He did worse sin. And David did worse than King Saul did. But you know the difference. David offered God first sanctuary. He said, I will give you sanctuary first, then me next. God said, even if your children behave worse than Eli, behave worse than the sons of Eli and of Saul, I will not remove them like I did to those ones. And God secured and said, secondly, you shall have light on the throne of Israel forever and ever, meaning till today, the children of David are still noble, royal, and great men in the nation of Israel. Why? He said, your temple, your sanctuary first before mine. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And then you will have what I call a total and a thorough and a complete package. I keep asking myself, first and foremost in life, and this is another message for another day, but I'll just give a hint on it. Every human being is built, empowered, irrespective of your tongue, irrespective of your tribe, no matter where you come from, no matter your religion, even if you're an atheist, even if you don't believe in God, you are built, endured by God, 
to be able to walk, to live, to eat, to drink, and to wear clothes. If it's to walk, to eat, to live, and to wear clothes, you don't need God. You are not, except you, you are naturally endowed to be able to do that. Even if it is just working as a, um, as a uh, um, low-skilled person, you'll be able to eat, you'll be able to drink. A lot of people who go abroad do unskilled work, and they're able to eat, they're able to drink, they're able to clothe. Even in those unskilled work, they're able to afford basic, simple accommodation. So the basic essence of living has been given by God to every human being. But Jesus said, life is more than food. Life is more than drink. Life is more than clothing. Meaning, you are not created by God to eat, to drink, and to wear clothes. In Ecclesiastes, he said it is a good thing from God for a man to eat, to drink, and to enjoy the labor of his hands. So it is a work of labor for a man to work, to eat, to drink, and put on. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and chapter 2, he says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So for a Peter, for him to feed, to eat, to drink, and take care of his children. He just needs to continue fishing. And you don't need God for that. At once, he won't catch as much as when Jesus said, let down your net. But there are days he will catch well if he's skillful, if he understands how the terrain of the waters is, if he can understand the timing with fishes. He will. There are people who don't believe in God who go to the sea and they catch fish and they leave. But for Peter to have his name on one of the pillars of heaven, the Bible says, and I saw the seven pillars of heaven. And on it was written, Peter, James, John. No, that's not going to come through fishing. No, 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 no. That is what has not entered into the heart of men. For every one of you out there, there is something God has prepared for you that your eye has not seen, your ear has not heard. It has never entered into your heart. That woman with the alabaster box never imagined in her life as a prostitute destroying people's homes that there is a gospel prepared with a name in it that must be preached on earth and in heaven. It never done on her. It never occurred to her in this life. Never. Abraham, I keep saying it. If you live in a housing estate, the housing estate, especially quite a lot more on the island than on the mainland, quite a lot of them, I don't want to mention any, where you, they have houses, they have a security post. Those houses are built by maybe a developer and he has the CFO of that house. When you buy the build and the sell, when you buy a house or a flat there, they give you a subtitle, a title deed of sub-owner or part owner. That means you are a co-owner to the person that owns the estate. It says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The heavens and the earth belong to the Lord. God owns heaven and earth. But Abraham is a co-owner of God with heaven. While Israel or Jacob is a co-owner of God with earth on earth. So whether you like it or not, Jacob owns the whole of the Middle East. It is his. Abraham owns the whole of paradise. Why God owns the holy city. No man can in his greatest wisdom can approach God and say, God, I have a request. Say, what's the request? Can I jointly own heaven with you? No man in his worst insanity would dare do it. But it was prepared for Abraham. Meaning, things you can never imagine that belongs to you. And all God says, put me first in all your consideration. Put me first. In your finances, put me first. In your career, put me first. In your life, put me first. In everything you do, fit me first. However, if all you want in life is to eat, like some are preaching, they say, what did so-so and so give? What did that give? What did this give? They mention names that are big. Even one of them is building a refinery. Do you know that in the Bible, in Mark chapter 10, there is a man, a rich man, whom I will liken 
to the owner of the largest refinery today, approached Jesus and said, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know what is written in the scriptures? Don't steal, don't kill, don't do all that evil. Do it and you should. He said, I have done all this because people are thinking that what these men have is all God has for them. No, they have not started what God has for them. They don't even have the picture yet. It's far. They can't even ask for it. And Jesus told the rich man, sell all you have. Give it to the poor. Come and follow me. Now, in further, that Mark 10 further verses, he said, there is no man who has left father, mother, houses, children, wife, lands, that who has left all these things for my sake, that shall not again inherit. But what Jesus wrote in the preceding verses, he left house. He shall inherit houses. He left, take note, the land he gave up is singular. He shall inherit, the lands he will inherit is plural. Meaning, as rich as this man is, he has not even started what God has for him. And some people will say, who did this one give to? Who did that one give to? That is what they, to them, that is one of the greatest attainments in life. They are myopic and they are narrow-minded. They don't have the mind of Christ. They can't access the mind of God. Who says, what I have for you, your eye has not seen. Their own eye has seen this. What I have for you, your ears not heard. Their ears heard this. What I have for you, have not conceived in your mind. Meaning, even for that rich man who was one, the Bible says, for he had great possessions. Meaning, he was one of the richest men in the whole nation. Yet, he had not started the journey of wealth. My goodness. And Lord was trying to make him understand. Come and adopt this principle of me first. And you will enter into what we have prepared for you. And I close by revisiting Peter again. Here is a skilled fisherman. Look, Peter, it is to feed your children, to take care of them, to clothe them, and to live a good life. There's a proverb in Yoruba. They say, Katerunje katerumu, katerinkomu, katerashowo. Meaning, if we can eat, if we can drink and have clothes to wear on, we will not be a subject of reproach amongst our contemporaries. That is one of the greatest evil on earth, that statement. And a man that imbibes it, imbibes what I would call retrogression, repression, and reversal in life. Because that fish that Peter was catching, when he let go of it and followed Jesus, now see what he inherited. He inherited powers to raise the dead back to life. He inherited powers to cause cripple to walk. He inherited powers. Then he inherited kingdoms. People think he was poor when he said, silver and gold, I have no. No. He said, the keys of the kingdom I give to you. The kingdom has wealth. Meaning, in a function of time, there is no need in his life that whatever he needed, that money could buy that he would not have been able to buy. So, it's a choice for us to make. If you want scripture to give, I will show you in the Bible. It says, give. And it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men pour into your bosom. If you don't want to give, I can also give you scripture. When Elisha told that woman, whose children were taken as slaves as born and shorty, for a loan the husband took, and she could not pay back, she called on the man of God, who gave her a miracle, he said, borrow vessels. What do you have? Say nothing but a small job. Say, fine. Pour the oil in the vessels. When she did, say the vessels are full. He said, pay your debt. He didn't say give. And leave on the rest. So you don't have to give. And if you want, you can give. 
What if I don't give? You have not sinned. If anybody told you you have sinned, it's a lie. You have not sinned. So you don't need to give to God, number one. If you want, you can put God number three. Put your own number one, your friends number two, your cousins number three, and put God last. You have not sinned. But when we get to heaven, you will know that all men are not equal. We're only the same. We can all wear white robes, but we don't wear the same medals. Two brigadier generals can stand, and you see one with the order of this, order of that, medal of this, and you see the other one play. They are both brigadier generals, but one has more medals than the other. Some have crowns on their head. The Bible says in Revelation 19, and I saw the word of God, Jesus, riding on a horse, and there were many crowns, meaning the crowns on earth, the crowns went into heaven. There were crowns, all manner, going from one crown to the other, like a million crowns on top of the Each crown represents victory, and each crown represents reward. Amen. And not only that, on the crown, some will have stars, some will have not stars. Some will have one, some will have few, some will have many. The choice is yours. No one is going to force you to do anything. You have a choice, but we will all face the consequences of every choice we make, whether good or bad, whether for God or for man. And if you do it for God, I know one thing, he will never, never, never fail nor disappoint you. I believe you have been blessed by that message. And I know your faith has been built up. And I know all those challenges in life are all going to fall before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to know Hebrews 12 says, Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. You need him in this walk. And so if you're out there and you don't have Jesus in your life, I want you to say after me, say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the only begotten Son of God. Come into my life, be my Lord and my Savior. It's as simple as that. Displayed on the screen is diverse information on how you can interact and reach out to us. Take advantage of it, and I'll be expecting to hear from you. Till I come your way again same time next week, I want to tell you, don't give up. Faith works. It's working, and it will work in your life. God bless you.